שיר. אמן, אמן. Okay. אני כל יום מניח תפילין שהוא יבוא, אבל לא נראה לי שהוא... נראה לי הוא איבד את הדרך, נראה לי. נראה לך, אה? אוקיי. אוקיי, אוקיי, דוקי. So uh, I called the night mask, little did I know that last year, the day after Purim was when all, all hell was about to break loose. We had a beautiful Purim party, um, only to find out the next day, as uh, Motse Purim, as we was try- trying to clean up from the Purim party, that uh, our kids aren't going back to school the next day. Um, and, uh, you know, that was it for quite some time. There was no more school. That was, it was... Yeah, it threw us all into turmoil for, for some. We were the first school to close, and it, it all, like, the Balagan kind of started. Anyway, we're a year later, and thank God we have a Purim plan, uh, a, a party planned as, you know, with the knowledge of Corona, and let's hope that, uh, that it stays that way and that we can go ahead with it and steam ahead as has been planned. There's a... Um, there's a wonderful story, and I think somebody may have said it recently at the Kiddush, but I, but I may be mistaken. The story is about Mendel Futafas. Now, Mendel Futafas was one of the great Hasidim of the previous generation. He was a man that had tremendous self-sacrifice. In just after the Holocaust, um, the the in 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 the communist russia stalin jews suffered tremendously under russia it wasn't quite the holocaust but it was it was really bad it was really difficult to be jewish and uh, everything jewish was outlawed and anybody that had opportunity to leave russia would take the opportunity um and after the holocaust um some i can't remember the exact year um Stalin gave permission to whoever had Polish citizenship to return to Poland. So Mendel Futafas, who was a Chabad Chassid, he started a movement of forging passports for people in order to get as many people out because staying in Russia was a death penalty to the person's Jewishness, to his Jewish identity. It just wasn't something that was healthy and uh, something that was really attainable or or sustainable. And uh, he managed to sneak out his family, his wife, his children, but he himself got caught and was thrown to Siberia in terrible, harsh labor for over 10 years. And he came out a very happy person, a very joyous person, and uh, there's lots of stories, incredible stories about him. One of the things that were unique about him is he moved to, uh, he, his, uh, his name was Menachem Mendel ben Menachem Mendel, which means uh, he had, uh, his father passed away before his bris. So he was unique in that way. But he was known as the big mashpia, one of the most famous mashpias. Mashpia is the people that teach and educate and for brain with the Hasidim, you know, uh, of, of his generation. He was known as one of the greatest, probably the most famous mashpia of this previous generation. He has tremendous stories of his time, always. He had a funny story for everything. Um, and he spent uh, his days with all different types of people. But I want to just tell you two little stories, two little anecdotes that he related from his time in prison. Number one, He was always joyous and he was always happy. And many of the people that he was imprisoned along with were very depressed and very sad. And uh, many of them had come from very high prestigious positions. They had been people in the government. They had been people that were doctors and lawyers. And for some reason, Stalin had got upset with them for whatever reason, maybe they'd try to escape and were caught, and for whatever reason, they were now in Siberia. Being in Siberia, in exile, in Russia, did not mean in the slightest that you were a bad person. On the opposite, many of those people were good. 
but they were also criminals. And these people were put together with real criminals. So one day, one of these highly educated people, a very uh, uh, sophisticated man says to him, I don't understand. How come you are sitting here in prison and you still remain upbeat and joyous? So he said, I'll tell you why, because I'm, you are in exiled and you are away. What, what makes you in prison? You're in prison because you have what you want to do. You have an agenda. Your agenda is, I want to be a lawyer. I want to be practicing law. I want to be practicing uh, my medical. I want to be part of the government policy. So whatever your, 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 your agenda is, he says, and that's why you're struggling. And that's why you're so upset because whatever you want to do, all your expectations are totally gone. Everything that you want to do, you cannot do. And there's nothing to be happy for. There's nothing that gives you satisfaction because you're not able to get satisfaction from anything. On the contra, uh, on the, uh, however, I am able to get pleasure and joy and satisfaction from anything I do. Why? Because I have a strong belief that wherever God wants me to be, that is where I will be. And the very fact that I'm right now in prison, it's because God wants me to be in prison. And that's why I am meant to be here. And I am joyous because I recognize that in prison, I can be successful, I can have an impact, I can, I can fulfill my mission, which is to serve God. Serving God is not dependent on being in a particular office or getting a particular type of paycheck or whatever it is. I find ways to serve God in every single possible way. That's story number one from Mendel Futterfuss. And it's very much connected to what I'm going to be telling you a moment about the story of Purim. But before I get back to the story of Purim, I want to tell you a second story. The second story is also by Mendel Futterfuss from his time in prison. He says that in his prison cell, he had whatever it was, 15, 20 people in the cell. We know that the, uh, the conditions over there were horrific. They say that Stalin killed at least 20 million people. Somewhere between 20 and 15 and 50 million people died under Stalin in the 30 years. He killed more than Hitler. But many of those people indirectly, just by sending them to exile, to suffering, some people were directly killed. But the level of damage and, and, and terrible things that Stalin did was equal to Hitler in the amount of, uh, of death that he caused. I don't think he killed six million Jews and he didn't have necessarily a whole process of killing, but just by simply killing everybody that he didn't like, he killed millions of people, literally. Um, now, in his cell, one of the rules that they had was you weren't allowed to play cards. But somebody had managed to sneak cards, a pack of cards, into the cell. And there was nothing nice or joyous that the people did. So the most of the prisoners would sit down and play cards. The one thing that a lawyer and the basic criminal knows how to do is they both know how to play cards. So they would play cards, but all of them would play cards. And Mendel wasn't interested in cards. He used to sit there. He knew the Tanya Balpe. He used to sit there revising Tanya in his mind. He always had what to learn because he knew hundreds of pages of Tanya Balpe off by heart. And every once in a while, while they were playing cards, the guard would suspect them and he would walk in on them. And somehow, as he walked in and them, the cards disappeared. And the card, the, the guard would do a frantic search of the whole cell, and he simply couldn't find it. And he would always leave empty-handed. But he knew that they were playing cards, and it made him so frustrated. So uh, the one day, Mendel, Mendel turns to one of the players and says to them, 
tell me what's what's going on how how come the guard is never able to find the cards i'm here sitting here i see you guys playing cards and they're gone a second later as soon as they're gone he says i'll tell you one of the prisoners over here is a professional uh pickpocketer he's really good at picking pockets that's that's his crime and uh Every time when the prison uh, guard walks in, he takes the cards and sticks them in his pocket. And when he leaves, he takes them out. And Reb Mendel said that that was one of the most powerful lessons he ever learned. That often in life, when we're looking for where the problem is, we think and we point at other people and we look to other places and other people that we could blame, but really and truly the problem is with us. So I want you to think about these two stories. The first story of how you found that Mendel is found in prison, but he's still joyous because in any place that he's doing, he's still serving God. And he always has a mission and a place in that place. And God put him there for a reason. And therefore, it's not as though my reason is to be a lawyer and I can't do that. No, my reason is to serve God. And, and therefore, if God puts me here, that's what I'm supposed to be. Now, I want to take you to an episode, one of the most famous episodes in in, in the in the uh, in the Megillah, and this is the episode that, uh, to a certain degree, um, is the most uh, important one, because this is where the real change happens. We've had the party, we've um, Haman has now gone to Achashverosh and asked that Achashverosh should destroy the Jewish people. And Mordechai goes and he puts sackcloth on and he goes crying. And Esther finds out about it, sends a message to change his clothes to find out what happened. And, 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 uh, and uh, she sends her servant Hasach to find out and she tells him and she says, and Mordechai sends a message back to Esther. He says, go to the king. Let me show you where this is inside the Megillah. Mordechai told him all that had befallen him in the full account, account of the silver that Haman had proposed to weigh out of the king's residence on the Jews' account to cause them to perish. And the copy of the root of the decree that was given to Shushan, he gave to him to show Esther. Okay. And he shows Esther. So Hasach comes back and tells Esther what Mordechai had said. Esther said to Asach, she said, so what does she say? He says, oh, Esther, you should go before the king to beseech for him and beg for him about, for your people. What's Esther's reply? Esther's reply is all the king's servants and the people the king's promises know that any man or woman who comes to the king into the inner court who is not summoned there is but one law from him to be put to death except the one to whom the king extends his golden scepter, that he may live. But I have not been summoned to come to the king these 30 days. So basically what she's saying is if I go now to the king, I, I have uh, you know, a certain death or a possible death on my head. And um, uh, it's too risky. This is what Esther so Mordechai ordered the reply to reply to Esther, and this is, I want to first read it in Hebrew. Do not imagine to yourself that you will escape in the king's house from amongst all the Jews. Number one, for if you remain silent at this time, relief and rescue will arise to the Jews from elsewhere, and you and your father's household will perish. And who knows at a time like this, you will attain the kingdom. Now, what this means is, it's an interesting, uh, it's, a, it's, it's an, a very fascinating little line. Why is it a, fa a fascinating line? Because at this point, this is where Mordechai convinces Esther to plead on the Jewish people's behalf and their case. And, and Esther is about to agree to go and, and, and put a life at risk for the Jewish people. 
But what was the message that, that Mordechai says? And this is the important point. And this message applies to all of us at all times. The message is, we have now a situation on our hands. The situation is that God has said, I am going to, for whatever reason, there's the decree against the Jewish people. Haman says, I'm going to destroy the Jewish people. Under any normal circumstances, there's no reason for the Jewish people to survive. Every single non-Jewish person, every soldier in the country has been ordered to kill any Jew that they know. There's only one person that could really stop this, and that's Ahasuerus, the king. So Esther tells, so Mordechai tells Esther, I want you to make sure that this ends. But Esther says, that's likely just to be the end of my life. So here's what, what, what Mordechai says. According to the Avnei Nezer, one of the famous ca- commentaries on the Tanakh, he says, Mordechai was saying to her like this, the very reason why you could have been made king, queen, sorry, God, why did he choose you? Why did Ahasuerus choose you? Do you think that Ahasuerus chose you because you're pretty? Who made you pretty? Do you think Ahasuerus had a liking to you just because whatever, that's just the way life is, that they found you and you happen to be the Jewish queen at this particular moment? It all just happens to happen at that moment. No. No. The very reason why you are made to be queen is to save the Jewish people. In other words, your very existence, your whole mission in life is, uh, is, is right here in front of you. And this is your chance. Are you going to accept it or not? I remember uh, several years ago, I was uh, at the Kines HaShluchim. And uh, the guests, many years at the Kines HaShluchim, at the banquet, the main, the main event of the Kines HaShluchim, the, con- the conference, the Shluchim conference, Chabad Rabbi's conference, um, they bring a, a guest speaker. Guest speaker meaning somebody that's not a, not a Chabad Rabbi to speak. Um, that year, the guest speaker was Joe Lieberman. Joe, Senator Joe, the previous former Senator Joe Lieberman, he almost became the Vice President of the United States of America, um, a, a religious Jew that uh, probably the highest, uh, one, was one of the most respected, till, till the, the Trump era, probably the, uh, a Jew that had the most, uh, a religious Jew to get to the highest position. I think Jared, Jared Kushner may, if you depend, have had a higher position than him in reality. Um, in the past administration. But anyway, that's just not, that's uh, not at all our discussion, but he had a very high position in the American government, very held, uh, held very highly, particularly in the Democratic Party. And he was the guest speaker that night. He happened to have a close relationship with the Rebbe and having been past the Rebbe numerous times. And he said, he said, he turned to the Shluchim and he said, I want you Shluchim to think of yourself as like Esther. He said, you know, the world, the Jewish people are in a strange circumstances. We find ourselves in a time where to be Jewish and involved in the Jewish world is hard. And for some reason, God chose the Rebbe and the Rebbe to, to, to send out you to be there for Jewish people in their struggles and to help them come or help them establish communities, help them connect to a community, help them to be part of a community, help them connect to the Judaism. But he says, don't think of it as, oh, you're so lucky, you're so privileged, or whatever it is. He says, God put you there for this reason. But he said, just like the story of Esther, Mordechai's response was, if you don't do it, somebody else will do it. God's plans always come about. But God gives us the opportunity to make it happen. And he said, God has given you, this was his message, which I thought to be a a beautiful message in a way, the opportunity to do it. So don't mess it up. Because 
God has plenty of people who he can make as his messengers. Okay, that was his message to us. But the truth is the story of Purim really turns around in this little episode. We know that to a certain degree, the main episode of the story we're told starts from Balayla Ahu, where it says on that night when, when King Ahasuerus can't sleep, that's when, I'll talk about in a moment, that's when things on a high, from the godly perspective, things start to change. But from the, the perspective of the people down here, where the change and transformation happens down here is in this moment. What was the moment? when Esther recognized that she was the person that was responsible to save the Jewish people, that she was given this mission and the opportunity to do it. Now, why is this important? In Hasidus, we often believe, we, we talk about everything being divine providence. Everything is for a particular reason. And this could be a struggle for many of us. We can think about it like, you know, what do you mean? Everything that happens, I, you know, was meant to happen. The Baal Shem Tov introduced the concept of Hashkacha Pratis, divine providence in detail, that every single detail to the smallest degree was there preordained by God. The only thing in the way, so to speak, is you and I. We have the choice whether to see it as preordained by God or not. Albert Einstein once said something like, either everything in the world is a miracle or nothing is a miracle. In other words, if you see and recognize that there's something beyond nature, that you see that there's a creator to the world, that every single thing from every single drop of science and biology and chemistry and um, physics, everything that exists within the world is just an absolute miracle or it's just one big mistake. But that's the perspective that you have to see. Mordechai was saying to Esther, you have to be the person to recognize that God has put you there. Now, I want to take this a step further. If you look into the Megillah, one of the most um, blatant and obvious ideas of the entire Megillah is that we're told that it doesn't mention Hashem's name, not even once. But the name of the Megillah signifies that concept. What's the Megillah called? Megillah's Esther. Why? Because at the end of the day, Esther was the one, as the episode I just explained, that she makes the decision to go to Ahasuerus and to change Ahasuerus' mind and ultimately save the Jewish people. The Talmud asks the question, Minayin Esther Batera, where do you have the name Esther in the Torah? And the Talmud answers us that we get it from Deuteronomy, from Devarim, the book of Devarim, when, when, um, I, I couldn't find the exact, exact source, but uh, what, is, what does Moshe Rabbeinu say to the Jewish people? He says, Va'anochi aster aster ponai mahem bayomahu. That I will, if you do a quick Google, Google, you would probably even find it. I will hide my face from them on that day. Now, here, here's the, 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 the story of the Megillah really is not just a episode that happened, and it is an episode that happened. We believe that whatever it's written in the Megillah actually happened. It's a true story. But the story of the Megillah is not an occurrence that happened once. It's the very story of our very existence. The Baal Shem Tov used to say, that if anybody reads the Megillah, Kalakuris Megillah, the Mafrey, it says if you read the Megillah out of order, you haven't fulfilled your obligation. That's what the Mishnah says. Jewish law says that. The Baal Shem Tov would reinterpret and says if you read the Megillah, the Mafrey, the Mafrey means like as if it's an old story, a story that epis that happened. Lemafreya, Lemafreya could mean in the past. 
if you read it as a story that happened in the past, lo yata, you haven't fulfilled the obligation. If it's a beautiful story that you can do a puppet show about, and you can make a nice movie about, or you can tell a story about or write a book about it, but it doesn't happen to you and it doesn't apply to you and you don't see the message of the story of the Megillah in your life, you have not fulfilled the obligation. Now, that's not the biblical, that's not the biblical law, but that's what the Baal Shem Tov is saying. He says, Lo Yotza, you have not, you've missed the whole point. The whole point of the Megillah is that you should be able to take the lessons of the Megillah and see how it's not a story that happened many years ago, it's a story that's happening today. So here's the thing. Esther, yeah, wow, you can say to yourself, well, Esther, Esther on the one hand, she was the queen. God put her in a unique situation. No, the whole Jewish people were threatened. If I was in Esther's position, I also would have done the right thing. Okay. But the truth is that there's a reason why we read the Megillah. The reason why we read the Megillah um, and we read the Megillah every single year, even though it's a story that happened to some lady some time ago, is, is why. Because the, the, the lesson from Esther is relevant to us. So here's the thing. I started off with the two stories from Mendel Futterfuss. The first story was that whatever circumstance you see yourself in, I want you to remember, you have to remember that God put you there for a reason. And over here you can serve God. The very fact that Esther was able to, see, to save the Jewish people was because she made that recognition. She said, I may be in prison. Esther didn't want to be in the, in, 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 the king, in the king's palace. If anybody tells you that Esther won the beauty pageant and became the queen and she was jumping for joy, I'm so excited to be the queen. Oh, what a romantic story. They, they missed the story. Esther was not at all happy to become queen. As a matter of fact, she tried to do whatever she can not to become queen. She finds herself in this position against her will. And she decides that she's going to act upon it and make the best of it. By the way, later on down the road, Esther also has a child from Achashverosh, who ends up allowing the Jewish people, giving the Jewish people permission to go and rebuild the temple. Right? So there's other things and special things that occur from it. But the very first and the main concept of Esther is this. The story of Purim is in a way of the Megillah. We don't read, you know, it's interesting. If you look at, for example, Hanukkah, look at Hanukkah, for example. What do you do on Hanukkah? Every day of Hanukkah, you light the menorah and you say Hallel. We say praise to Hashem. We thank Hashem. Do we read any Megillah? No. There was a Megillah written about, about Hanukkah, but it's not very well respected. It's not part of the Torah. It's not considered one of the holy books. It's called Megillah's Antiochus. Okay? Um, they don't even teach us to, in schools. It's not, it doesn't have high regard. We have the story from wherever we have the story. The Megillah, the story of Purim. What's the main mitzvah of Purim? Four mitzvahs. The first thing is to hear the Megillah in the night and the day, to give gifts of food, to give gifts of money to poor people, and to have a feast. Why don't we say Hallel? Why don't we say, we say the praise? Because the, the, the Purim story is the greatest praise that you can give God. Why is it the greatest great praise? Because the very name of the Purim story is that God is hidden and concealed from us. Yet at every single moment I recognize it's twofold. Number one, the, the story is called Megillus Esther, he's concealed. On the other hand, God's name is not even mentioned. 
In other words, if you want, you can see the story of Purim as having absolutely no divine influence and input whatsoever. You could look at it as being a totally God-forsaken episode. It happened to be that Esther was there. It happened to be that Mordechai was there. What happened to be that whatever, a bunch of coincidences that saved the Jewish people. There's no miracles. There's no splitting of the sea. There's no mention of God. You, there's no hand of God. There's nothing. You don't even mention God's name. But the answer to that is in the name. I was hiding. I was there the whole time. And what's the lesson to you? Twofold. Number one, I am in your life at every single moment. You may not see, but I could tell you there's divine providence. God is controlling every single thing. Number one, God is in touch and control of every single thing that goes on in your life. And he's part of every single element. I'm present, but you may not always be able to see me. But if you choose like Esther did, that you went beyond the concealment and she decided to see that God was present in that situation. And even before the decree happened, what came first, the decree or Esther's position? First, Esther was put into that position. The cure is always there first. Esther was put in that position, then the decree came, and Esther was able to save. Why did God do it? That I don't know. In order that we should be able to have this, uh, this important lesson, that God is involved in every single situation. You know, there's another one other point I want to mention to you. Why did this whole decree happen? So many people say, the Talmud says like this, why did Haman, how was Haman able to make the decree against the Jewish people? It says, because they had Hanoa benefit from the Suda of Oisri Russia. They enjoyed this, the, 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 the feast of that wicked man. What a sin. So some people say, oh, you know why? What was wrong with going to the, the feast of that man? It was not kosher. The Jewish people fell into the trap. They thought, you know what? The king is inviting you, the most mighty person in the world. We have to obey and we have to follow the path. So we have to eat the non-kosher food in order to obey the king. The only problem with that is that the very, and that's what some people interpret, but the Rebbe says that's not possible because the same Megillah says, and if I have a second, I'll show you. It says, La so is kirtan ish for ish. That the whole point was, if you look over here, oh, I didn't share screen. Whoops. Look here. It says, um Vashtriya Chadas and the drinking was according to the law with no one coercing no one was coerced, everyone was given apparently to drink based on the age for so had the king ordained every, upon every steward of his house to do according to every man's wish La Sois Kritzoin Ish Faish what does that mean? everyone was prepared meals exactly the way they wanted no one was forced to have non-kosher. And therefore we see, says the Rebbe, and many, and many other commentaries, by the way, that the people never ate non-kosher. So what was the tremendous sin? Here was the sin. The Jewish people thought, you know, if we are invited to the meal of the king to come and eat with the king, that must be something special. You know, we have finally made it. If we are invited to eat with the king, we've finally made it. That was their problem. What that means is we as Jewish people don't need to wait 
till we get invited by the dignitaries of the time to feel like we've made it. We've made it because we are the Jewish people, because we have a special mission, because God chose us in Mount Sinai to do special things. Every person, whether the Jews or not, is special. No question about it. But we haven't made it when some non, some Gentile king somewhere invites us and now you've made it. That's what they felt because they had benefit from the fact that they were invited to the king. They felt all special. What does this mean? That means that they forgot that at the end of the day, God controls the world. God's in con conducting the world. And he's the one that decides what we should and shouldn't do, shouldn't get. And when we forget and we start relying on the local governments or on other people to do what we have to do, that's when trouble starts. So therefore what happened? God allowed Haman to make this decree and the Jewish people then realized their mistake that they had got all cozy with the government. They started to rely on the government they thought that it was the government that was protecting them. And that's when they prayed to God and they said, no, God, we made a mistake. We recognize that you are the one that we have to cozy up to and we have to be close to you and not try to only become close to, 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 to governments and to people in power. Because at the end of the day, it's not the people in power that have the power, it's you that have the power. And as we see in the, in the middle of the story. So, so therefore, the message of the Megillah that I want to bring, there's thousands of messages that we can learn from Megillah, but for me, the most general messages of the Megillah is this. When we look at the story of the Megillah, we see a few things. Number one, the name of the Megillah is called the, 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 the Megillah of Esther, of concealment, to teach us that what? That... to teach us that in every single episode in our life, God is there, but he's concealed. Number two, the second lesson I want to bring out to you, and by the way, we don't mention God's name, but we're told that every time that it says the king, referring to HaMelech HaChashverosh, it actually has a significant resemblance to the king, that HaChashverosh, in his wickedness, who he was, but he was also God's puppet. You see that at the beginning of the story, Achashverosh gives in to Haman's idea. And then later on at the story, he gives in to oppose Haman. To tell you that what? He was God's representative. Who was God's representative in the story? Achashverosh. Every time it says, Hamelech, it was referring to God. At the beginning of the story, when the decree happens, Hashem was welcoming the decree, so to speak. Then when the Jewish people woke up and they remembered who they were and they remembered that this was planned by God and God had even placed Esther there in the first place to, to save them and protect them and was taking control. Then what happens? We're told that what's the most important stop part of the Megillah? I just told you the more important part of the Megillah is, is the story of part of Esther where Esther takes, takes control. But when does it have an impact? It says, Balailahu, the night that Achashverosh can't, can't sleep, it says, Balailahu, the, 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 the Talmud says, the most important part that you have to read is from Balailahu. What is the story? The night that Achashverosh can't sleep. It says, Balailahu, not in Ashnas HaMelech. You'll hear that the person reading the Megillah will go loud at that moment. Why? To tell you at that moment, God says, Aha. My children are starting to wake up. Therefore, I'm going to start to change the picture. And what happens? Haman comes. Um, uh, first, what happens? King Ahasuerus says, well, we've got to give uh, a reward to Mordechai. And Haman, you're going to be the one to do it. Right? Suddenly, everything's getting turned upside down. What had happened? Because the Jewish people had started to change. Ahasuerus is just a little puppet. We're told that Yad Malachim be Yad Hashem, the hand of kings are in the hand of God. So, whatever, take it however you want. Look at people in government or, or leaders to a certain degree. What they're doing is a resemblance of what God wants to happen. 
Uh, but, Rabbi, um, could this add insight into uh, uh, something I read about uh, the, the, the vessels from the base of Migdash that Hashvei Rosh took out the, the vessels and used them for the Mishnah for the feast? No, I think you're trying to. I don't. I don't think so because we're not saying that we're not saying that Achashverosh was a bad man. He and his call was bad. He was willing to kill the king. He, he to kill the Jewish people because it was opportune. He didn't care. So that was an evil thing. That was his mistake. Um, but from a deeper sense, in other words, I think what you're trying to say is that it's an interesting connection. That and that therefore maybe because he had some type of godly connection therefore he was allowed to use the priestly vessels the vessels from the temple is that what you're trying to say yeah well yeah that um basically using those vessels was an insult to the jews present at the mishnah and that was like wake up call um yeah i um i i've never heard that connection i've never really had that connection interesting point okay um hopefully my wife will message me when the teachers call so we might have a couple couple more um a couple more minutes um so the the story of akash veros is um joe the, the the idea is that he himself is a bad person but god puts him there as his puppet and then when the king with the the the, the, the megillah he refers to this twist that happens in the life of Ahasuerus, where he kind of goes from being pro the decree and anti the decree and, and twisting it over, is, is the story of God going through this moment of being, so to speak, happy at the Jewish people. And then when the Jewish people wake up and decide to change, then God, so to speak, changes because he's woken them up. Okay? But he acted as though he was sleeping. All right. But the final point is this. I, I, I relate to you the other story of the man that put the cards in the, in the, in the pocket of the guard, in the prison guard. And uh, it's, it's this, the same point of the other story, the story of Esther, to tell us this. Just like Esther, she could have looked at the situation and said, it's terrible. You know, what can I do? What am I able to do? What, 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 uh, what choice do I have? I, mean, I can't go, I'll get killed. But she recognized that, you know, she has to do what, she, what, what her job is. And the rest is up to God. If God wants her to die, she'll die. But she's found herself in a position that she happens to be the only person that could solve the situation. She's going to take care of it. Don't start looking at everybody else that's got the problem. The cards may be in your own pocket. And that's what I'm trying to say, that Esther is not just a lady, that, a great lady that lived some time ago. Esther is us in every situation that we find ourselves in life. And we may not be doing as grand things as, um, as saving the Jewish people, but in our own lives, it is grand. When we have the chance to, to, to do something great and we have that test whether or not we should do it, we are Esther. We, we, God gives us particular opportunities and we say, are you going to achieve it or not? Are you going to do the right thing or not? Or are you going to let somebody else do it? God's will will ultimately be fulfilled. The question is if you will be God's emissary to make it happen. And if you are, it will happen quicker. You'll make Moshiach come quicker, but you've got to do your part. You have to be your Esther and recognize that the cards are in your pocket. And don't wait for somebody else to make things happen because God has put you there for that reason. Um, I'll just conclude with a quick story that um, there's a lady by the name of Hannah Sharfstein that... Uh, she, uh, the Rebbe started in the early years some type of uh, um, organization for, for women called the Sheikh Chabad. He was the first one to start women's organizations and, and, and leagues or whatever it is. And uh, they went and they had a whole big conference. And then um, they did the conference and they got snowed in. And their flight was canceled. They wrote a letter to the Rebbe complaining. And the Rebbe said, I don't understand. 
you complaining that your flight was called in? Didn't you talk about in the conference how in every situation God has put you as women, as Esther's in the world to make a difference? And if, the, and if God snowed in your plane, then it's for a reason. I'm sure you found an opportunity to make the best of it. And she went on to say how they recognized, wow, the Rebbe's message. And they went and they did something. I can't remember the exact details. And they found a few people that didn't have Shabbos candles and needed some help or whatever it is. And they made a big difference in a short amount of time. But the lesson was powerful. The same lesson is for us. We're living in a crazy time, coronavirus or whatever it is, restrictions, lockdowns, every situation is for a reason. When you have an opportunity to do something, to make the best of that situation, make sure you make it happen. I've got to run, but uh, thank you so much everybody for joining and looking forward to seeing those of you that will be joining us on Friday afternoon or Friday evening for the Purim party. Um, and we'll also be doing Megillah on Thursday night over here in Chabad Dingli. Um, okay? What time? Um, okay. Around 8.30. The earliest you could learn Megillah is really 8.34. Um, so you can't do it too early, so it's not going to be early, but around 8.30, okay? I'll, I'll, I'll work it out. I'm just trying to figure out what's the program. Okay. Have a good night, everybody. Thank you so much for joining. Thank you, Rabbi. Thank you. Thank you very much. Powerful messages. Okay. Thank you. Cool.